Hello, everybody. I'm Marty Miller, Director of Education and Training for TechnoGym North America, and I've been a regional master instructor for the National Academy of Sports Medicine for the last 15 years. And today I'm so excited to bring these two amazing companies together in this webinar and discuss the concept of exercise versus training. As we go through, feel free to send questions into the chat box and we'll be sure to either answer them at the end or again, I can always reach out to you and answer your questions individually. So just a little bit about me. I've been with TechnoGym in this role now since the beginning of 2018. I have you know 20 years plus experience in sports medicine, performance enhancement, injury prevention, as well as working in the educational curriculum development field. I have an undergrad in sports medicine from Canisius College. I'm a licensed athletic trainer, and I earned my master's in exercise science and injury prevention from California University of Pennsylvania. And then I received my doctorate in health sciences from A.T. Still University in Mesa, Arizona. So I'm really looking forward to you know, using my years of experience in the industry as in the fitness industry as well now working for TechnoGym to go over this really fun concept of exercise versus training. So as we move into the webinar here, you're gonna see some major concepts. So having my background in sports medicine, working with elite athletes twice, you know, it's, it's, I've got the privilege to work with some of the greatest minds in, in sports science. And what I've always learned is a lot of the things that we see in the fitness industry, because I've spent a lot of my time in the fitness industry, is the trends, the fads, the research, most of it, or a lot of it will stem from what happens with elite athletes. And that is the amazing thing about being with Techno Gym is being a worldwide leader in sports training and innovation. You'll see some other slides here in a little bit about our partnerships. We really get in, hands, uh, in touch with the world's greatest coaches and we see what's going on in sports medicine and performance enhancement and can bring that into the fitness industry. So these scientific advancements lead to a large body of research that again will show us best practices in how to create specific training outcomes in key physiological capacities. And the ones we're gonna to cover today are power, agility, speed, and stamina. We know athletes utilize training programs to ensure that they achieve very specific results. And what I see in the fitness industry is all too often people just engage in an exercise program, and we'll spell out the definition here in a little bit and they're less focused on the science and they're just focused on burning calories or just you know creating very fun and engaging workouts and there's nothing wrong with that but we want to make sure that people get the best outcome so we want to make sure that the science is there so those are the key points that we're going to talk about in today's webinar now for all of you that are on the webinar from NASM you guys know the model we'll review that briefly as we go through and we're just going to again define the definitions of exercise versus training, then show some practical applications. So as we move forward, we're gonna go into the next slide. So let's just talk about the definitions. Now, if you look these up, there are more than these that you'll see in the literature or out there on exercise and training. So these were two that I grabbed. And I'm just gonna say right off the bat, these are the ones that I like to use. There's, there's more and you might find a different definition that you like to use. But for the sake of the webinar as we move forward so there's some common ground, an exercise or an exercise program will be an activity requiring physical effort carried out to sustain or improve health and fitness. Where if you see the definition of training, training is teaching or developing oneself or others any skills and knowledge or fitness that relates to specific useful competencies. So I'm going to pause here and that's why I highlighted it. You see that it's a more specific definition and that even in the definition, the word specific is there. Specific, useful competencies. Training has specific goals of improving one's capability, capacity, productivity, and performance. So why we pause here for a minute, think about what goes on, and I'm not saying how you work with your clients. I'm thinking about the fitness industry as a whole. I was in the gym this morning working out, and I had my very specific training program. I knew exactly what I was working on, what capacities I was working on, how I wanted to work on my human movement, and what physiological capacities, and what phases of training I was in. And as I watched around the rest of the gym, I saw people putting in effort, burning calories, but I saw bad movement patterns. I saw, well, that might be a stabilization exercise. They might be working on stamina, but now they just went over to power. And I'm not there to criticize anybody because clearly we are the exercise professionals. And without our help, how would people know how to maneuver through a program on their own? 
just like I hire professionals all the time. I go to doctors, I have lawyers, I have other people, accountants that help me in very specific areas because I don't have the expertise they do. However, in our industry, what I have found is anyone can participate in our industry and sometimes they'll stumble into good results. Maybe they have great genetics. Maybe they just work hard enough and they burn enough calories and maybe they've got the DNA to put on muscle mass. So all of a sudden now maybe their knowledge in their mind is a little more than what we as professionals would say. Not knocking it by any means. I want people out in the gym. I want people working hard. My main goal though as an athletic trainer going back to my original background is first, do no harm. As a medical professional, we want people never to get hurt as we work with them. That's the first goal. So as I see people in the fitness industry going through exercise programs, all too often I see them putting in more effort maybe than they need to to get those results or accepting maybe soreness and injury as a part of, well, that's what it's like to work out. So we want to go through some of those thought processes and challenge you and anyone else saying, am I on an exercise program or am I in a very specific training program, as you'll see here for specific competencies and specific goals of improving one's capability, capacity, productivity, and performance. Now, doesn't mean an exercise program, well, that's more fun than a training program. We're only going to go through the science on what would be response. However, how you make it engaging with the atmosphere, you can still make it very, very fun and, and get, uh, in, enjoyable. So don't think that as you're training people, you have to take away some of that entertainment factor that people might use our services for to get through their workouts as well. So as we slide forward here, we'll continue on talking about these concepts. So one of the concepts you know, that I want to talk about is where did all this come from? So NASM, you guys all know everything's evidence-based. It's all been researched. Now, from the Technogym standpoint, we're based out of Chisane, Italy. We were founded in 1983 by Mr. Neri Alessandri, who still has the same passion he did back then to, to move this company forward as a thought leader worldwide. And we are so privileged that you know, for myself, I get to work for a company that has been chosen to be the sole provider equipment for soon to be the last eight Olympic Games. We were ready to go to Tokyo this year, but obviously with this unique time frame, everything's been delayed to 2021. And now I'll pause. Think about the training that now has to shift in those elite athletes. They have to now look at a whole nother 12 month cycle on how they're going to prep themselves to be ready for those Olympic trials if they still have to qualify or the Olympics themselves. They're not exercising, they're training. So the reason why I like to highlight this from a Technogym standpoint is one, Technogym was chosen because of what we are as a company, the research and engineering that goes behind it. But the beauty behind this is Technogym utilized the last seven Olympic games is the best case study in human performance. You have male athletes, female athletes, power athletes, endurance athletes, and you have some of the greatest or most of the greatest coaches worldwide all in one area for a short period of time. So Technogym has leveraged this knowledge and partnership to create amazing equipment, but also amazing training solutions. So just as we go through this again, think about how an athlete would train to prep. We, and it, this is a very unique time right now. You, you, if you follow sports, you probably heard about the NBA. They're trying to figure out, well, when would we start? How do we let our athletes prepare? Same thing with the NHL. How would we now allow them to get prepared to compete again? So time for the right training adaptations to peak at the right period of time. So we'll slide forward here into the next slide. And one thing that I always like to talk about with everybody I've ever trained is everybody's an athlete. Now, real briefly, I've worked with professional sports twice, and it was both times in professional baseball. And then I worked in different levels and different parts of fitness, mainly uh, primarily in the private country club market. So I had a lot of, uh, let's call them senior athletes that would play golf, tennis and things like that. And one time I was asked a question at one of my country clubs just after I had left professional sports again. My good friend, Jay, he asked me, he goes, Marty, how do you train us differently uh, now that you're not training elite athletes? And it took me a half second. I said, I don't train you any differently. And at first he gave me that look like, okay, you don't need to be polite. I know I'm a member, but seriously, how do you train us differently? And I said, I don't train you differently. I said, Jay, you're an athlete. You've got the same muscles, same bones, moving the same planes of motion, and you have the same human capacities, power, agility, speed, stamina, your capacity 
Let's look at that. They're there. Your ability to maximize those capacities like an elite athlete, yes, it's different. I know I, I'm not going to be as powerful or as fast as some of the people I've ever had the privilege to train. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't train myself in a, in a program that would elicit my best responses within those capacities. So we're always encouraging people to free the athlete within. And when you look at the NASM OPT model, that's exactly where it was designed by Dr. Mike Clark for elite sports performance and injury prevention and performance enhancement. And it was a progressive model that made people move better, put them through the right amount of stabilization so they had that foundation to move under load better in the strength phases and then move better at high speed in the power phase. So that's why, again, I love our partnership together with NASM and Technogym because we're thinking the exact same way. It's how do we apply the world's greatest science to what we do as companies? So I'm gonna challenge you all to get your members, clients, to free the athlete within. So now we're gonna move into the... So again, when we look at from a primarily a cardiovascular standpoint or sports performance standpoint, we have the pillars. We have speed, power, agility, and stamina. And every elite athlete and their coaches will focus on these four pillars. Now the foundation you see there is fundamental proper human movement, flexibility, strength, stability, right? That's the, that's the in NASM terms, that's the stabilization and or combination of corrective exercise. Then we can pour in the performance metrics of these other pillars. Now, what I like to say is uh, in my house, I am not the cook. My wife is a far greater cook than I am. And one night you were during this pandemic, we were, I was home and I said, hey, I got done with work earlier. Can I help you out with cooking? And she goes, yeah. And I said, can you provide me the recipe? You know, I didn't say it quite that way, but I was like, can you tell me what you want me to do? And she goes, do this, this, and this. And I said, let me make sure I got this. You want me to do this, this amount of this, this amount of that, this temperature for this. And she goes, yeah, I follow those exact instructions to the T because I'm not trained. I followed the instructions she gave me. I didn't go off those instructions. And guess what I got? She was very impressed with the way the dinner came out. And the reason I bring that up is in fitness, in sports performance, there is the recipe to develop speed. We know the science. There's the recipe to develop power, agility, and stamina. And if you follow those recipes, just like if you go through the different phases of training, that's your recipe. If you follow it, you're going to get great outcomes. But if you don't follow it, you start throwing a bunch of things in. Like if I changed her recipe in the kitchen, it wouldn't have been what she asked me to do. And it could have maybe been better, but probably I wouldn't have gotten as good and desired of an outcome because I'm not trained to make those adjustments. So when you look at these pillars, whether you work with the world's greatest coaches like we have in the Olympics, when you follow your OPT evidence-based model, your recipe to achieve those adaptations are there. That's a training program. Exercise is when you see a bunch of things thrown together and yes, it's human movement. Yes, you can accidentally improve some of these capacities and then, yes, you can burn calories and get leaner and things like that. But what if you follow the recipe more specifically? Yeah, you got – I can't argue the gains you got, but we could argue you might have gotten better gains quicker, safer, more effectively. So we're not, again, not asking you to have fun in your workouts, not get creative, and not make it enjoyable and challenging appropriately. Just understand the science is the science, and your recipes are there for these four pillars and everybody you work with, regardless of age, can improve these capacities within their abilities. So we'll go to the next slide here and we'll continue that. So I love this slide because you'll see here training outcomes. It says before training program, but you could also put exercise program there. And then you see to the right after a training program. So I put the four pillars in there that we're going to talk about, speed, agility, stamina, and power. And again, from an NASM standpoint, you could put in stabilization, strength, strength endurance, max strength, power, right? There's a lot of things that could make up this uh, diagram. So there could be people that are very, very fit, but maybe they know one form of exercise or they have something they prefer. It's not well-rounded. We want everyone to be well-rounded, even the world's greatest athletes that are sprinters. They train in other pillars as well. Yes, they may have a primary focus, but trust me, they're not just doing one phase of training 52 weeks a year. So before a training program, someone might be shifted 
And they might be really, really good at that, or they may be shifted towards that and they're still deconditioned. Again, that is up uh, individual by individual. But after a training program, we want to see a more well-rounded program. And you can see that in the diagram in the right, one on the left. Now, this is just a quick visualization. So we've got 1.2 there is the high for speed. Maybe this is me. Maybe I've worked as hard as I can at my current abilities in that capacity, and that's me towards my best. Now, you take a, a sprinter like Michael Johnson at his heyday. You know, we've got uh, a great relationship, relationship with Michael, Michael Johnson. No way would I ever, ever come near his max capacity, right, or inability. His would be off the chart. So we're not trying to compare me versus a world-class sprinter. We're trying to compare me towards what is my best outcome and can I get towards maximizing that. So that's why I like this diagram. And all of you that are NASM certified and other fitness professionals, you understand that's why we do the assessments to get that baseline. So we understand someone's starting point and how we progress. And if we're assessing now, it gives us the answers to what we need to put in to get them towards their peak. So again, we'll move forward here. Now, one of the things I like to do, and again, this is just assessment. So for Techno Gym, we have our skill line. There's four pieces. The skill run I didn't put in here uh, for this demonstration. We have our skill mill, which is our curved non-motorized. The skill bike is a, has a, all these have multi-drive, which creates a magnetic resistance can emulate 15 degree incline to three degree decline. And then our skill row, again, traditional rower, then has the multi-drive so I can take it right from cardio to power. So that's how the skill line was born, is can te TechnoGym challenge themselves? Can they create a cardiovascular line that seamlessly transitions right from traditional cardio or stamina and immediately to power? So all the four skill pieces have multi-drive technology that allow that seamless transition. But also you can, test your agility, your speed. So what I've come up with on the pieces is assessments. Now there are some embedded into each piece, but assessments where each pillar can be challenged and tested so I can you know, motivate people, I can have a challenge that month. Okay guys, I want everyone's top speed on the skill bike or a bike because that's something everyone can achieve, right? You don't have to be as fit to do top end speed on a bike. It's your top end speed under control. And then you track it over a month and you're working that whole month on speed development or speed on a, on the row, our skill row, could be how many strokes per minute for 100 meters. A lot of cool ways to gamify it, to create assessments, to create challenges, to motivate people. Feel free to have a leaderboard. Because again, if I'm assessing these things and creating the right training programs, everyone's gonna improve over that period of time. So that's just the kind of what we're looking at with our skill line combine. So as we move forward, we'll continue on. So this here now is an exercise training outcome. So this is my data, uh, just to give, so that's why I can share it. So we have a, th I did a three minute power test on our skill bike, very challenging. Now, my cardio is good, but I am newer to cycling. So there was a, a specific muscle adaptation that I had to get used to. Again, a training outcome where I was doing more uh, boxing, kickboxing, and running and rowing for my cardio. So this was something that I really wanted to get better at. So you can see from March through the May, you can see there was a, over a 10% increase in VO2 max, estimated VO2 max on this uh, power test. My power went from 557 to 628, so a nice increase there. You, so it did, you know, again, you can look at different things here. Uh, the power to weight ratio improved. Fatigue index went up because I had hit a higher total peak power. So again, there's a lot of data there. But the key thing here is instead of just getting on my skill bike and pedaling, I'm testing myself monthly. And it's uh, actually today's the day, guys. Uh, wish me good luck. I got to do this test again today or tomorrow to see how my last month of training went. And I should have done it before the webinar to give you one more row of data. But see, this is, again, taking exercise versus training and looking at the difference. So we'll slide forward here on the next slide. All right. So another amazing test that I love is the Techno Gym Max Power Test. So this is our skill run. 
motorized, non-motorized treadmill. So pushing a sled is phenomenal. You may use it in your gym now, a traditional sled, or you may have access to the skill run or even the skill mill with has the handles with the magnetic resistance. The key thing here is when you look at a sled push, it's a very, very safe power assessment for everybody. Not everyone can do plyometrics. Not everyone can do some of these other more advanced power techniques. But when you're looking at a sled push, your feet are always in contact with the ground. So a lot safer to do sled pushing. And then again, let's not do it just to burn calories. Let's do it for specific outcomes. So you're going to see here in the next slide that we have a very specific form that is utilized on our skill run to, per, to determine someone's max power. So this is embedded into the skill run. There's a proper warm up and there's a three minute walking recovery in between sled pushes. Males get 50, 70 to 90 percent of their body weight. Females get 40, 60, then 80 percent of their body weight for 15 meters or 17 yards. At one of those three sled pushes, you will get your peak wattage, right? Because it's going to be how fast versus the resistance. So I can't tell you it's always going to be in the third push. It depends on each person's individual abilities. But the beautiful thing here is it's reproducible. I can do something with the results. And the results will give me peak wattage. So you can have, again, a contest in your facility. Who's got the peak wattage? But let's say I'm 170 pounds and I'm competing against a guy 240. Clearly, he's going to have a huge advantage. And same thing with male versus female. But what you'll find is you can develop peak wattage per pound of body weight. So now you can level the playing field. And again, I can use this in, before someone signs up for a six-week program with me as a fitness professional. I can do this as an assessment and then do it again at the end of the six weeks to say, look, at you made a 38% gain in your power. Or a lot of different ways to do it. But again, this is taking it into a training outcome versus let's just push a sled and push it from there to there. And did you get your heart rate up? Right. So we're going to take it a little more training specific. So we'll move into the next slide here. Another beautiful thing about what Techno Gym has developed. And again, you guys all know this if you're NASM certified about what's going on right versus left. Well, you know about that from asymmetrical shifts and watching people move. Well, this takes it now and allows you to use that same information, but look at when people are running. We have biofeedback in our skill run. So the beautiful thing about this is we always want outdoor running enthusiasts to continue to run outdoors. But the skill run is the only indoor treadmill that outdoor running enthusiasts must come in and train on because now I can measure you under fatigue. I can measure you in different environments and see how efficient of a runner you are. High level runners, if there's any of you on the, on the webinar, you all know this, that I can run at eight miles an hour and have different cadences or strides per minute. And if I have a very or a lower strides per minute, that means I'm over striding and now I'm landing with my lead leg out in front of me, which means I'm actually decelerating every time I hit the ground and all that resistance or the, the force comes back through my kinetic chain. So this outside of all of you from NASM know the anterior tip and the posterior tip and the glutes and why they need to be firing at the right time. But even if they're looking good on a movement assessment, but have bad running efficiency, there's only so much that the anterior tip and posterior tip and glute medius can do when you're increasing all that force through the kinetic chain. So we blend these two together, get them to move well, get them to run well, now you've got something there to improve their performance. So this will measure your strides per minute. This will measure your ground contact time, flight time, the propulsion time, but it'll also give you right versus left leg, ground contact time and stride length. And I really like to do this with elite runners under fatigue because they might be able to do the first five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, fine. But then all of a sudden they start to break down or at a slight incline or a slight decline because now they have to decelerate themselves. So again, just grabbing that data, using it to create a training program to improve their performance. So we'll move here to the next slide. Now with that, again, assessments are great, but if you don't know what to do with them, then you know sometimes you won't get the best outcome. So embedded into it is a cadence training program in the skill run. So now, you can get people on and get them to become a more efficient runner. So there's basically a running coach embedded in the skill run for you. It's going to evaluate your running for a few minutes and then give you suggestions on how, what stride pace you should be running at versus the speed. So now you can really improve in your running efficiency. 
we'll move forward again. I love this slide here. This shows a workout of the same individual in one week. He did four different workouts. He's conditioned, but you'll see he did a stamina workout, an agility workout, a speed workout, and a power workout. And you'll see the heart rate variation. So once again, even though people may love to do stamina or love to do power, we, we're not going to get into the physiological differences of what goes on in the body for the heart and the cardiovascular system during these different type of workouts, but you can see the heart rate responds differently. So again, it's important to be able to, just like you do in the OPT model, undulate their program, go from stabilization to strength, and there's a couple different levels, of course, in power. Same thing with our cardio. There's time to do stamina. There's time to do agility. There's time to do speed. There's time to do power. What's appropriate for that individual? as well as what their training goals are. So again, just a nice visualization here so you can see the different heart rate responses. So we're gonna slide forward here. This is just an example of now going from cardiovascular into resistance training. Once again, when you look at the NASM model, you know that there's different times under tension, there's different tempos. So when you look at what TechnoGym does, we have a very unique piece of equipment uh, or in a circuit called BioCircuit that will provide different resistance profiles depending on the person's goals. And it's all done from a very unique advanced motor. We've actually partnered and patent, uh, have a, a working relationship with NASA, so they get to use this amazing piece of equipment in outer space. We get to use it here on planet Earth. But the motor provides the resistance, but it provides it specifically on the individual training goal set forth by that person's fitness professional. So we have a different program that will reduce the eccentric, right? Someone newer to resistance training, we don't want that delayed onset of muscle soreness. We have the second one that you'll see with the green where it comes up gradually. So the second one on the, side, on the left is it's a gradual increase in resistance. So it takes away the in, uh, initial inertia. Someone who may have a little stress in their joints, anytime you start from a dead stop, there's more stress in the joints. So it allows you to gradually build in. And then there's a spotter. So all of a sudden at 50%, if you're fatigued, drops the weight. So again, working on very specific training outcomes. Then if we wanna burn more calories with resistance training, we know we need to get more repetitions in in that time that we're gonna allow someone to work out. So it's a one-to-one -one concentric to eccentric and they pick up the tempo a little bit. Then the top on the right side of the screen here, you'll see where they add eccentric load because there's a time where we wanna do more negative work. Again, it has the spot there in case they get fatigued. And the last one you see on the right is a viscous response, explosive. Each repetition might be different because it depends how much energy I put in. So once again, there's different training outcomes based on the person's abilities and what phase of training they're in. They're not just exercising by picking up weights and not focusing on their tempo and what part of the muscle contraction spectrum is the most important and appropriate. So again, this is why these two companies match the DNA and the science so well. So I just thought this was kind of an interesting slide to discuss. So we'll move forward again. Now, as an athletic trainer, I'm gonna come back to this. I mentioned at the very beginning, I got into this career because I wanted to hang out with athletes and work with athletes because my uh, ability was uh, done in college. That's the, the maximum I could play. And I figured, okay, great career, athletic trainer. Now, I wanna bring this up. So if we look at the far left, we cannot prevent collision injuries. Now, I'm not saying that that's what this is. It's just an image I used. I don't know what, it, you know, he could have pulled a hamstring, could have pulled a groin, could have done anything. But let's just assume the individual on the left, there was a collision. That could happen. And, you know, we, we can't prevent that. Then if we slide over to the image on the right, let's assume that this person, she's playing lacrosse and she's running and she's like, you know what? My knee's been bothering me. I, I just need to shut it down. Maybe a... a a longer term overuse injury. And then we have the individual here in the center who momentarily his facial expression will change, I'm sure, as we see that quick change of direction type of deceleration injury. So the reason I bring this up is we do not play sports because they're good for us. Okay. I don't care. I've, I've had this conversation with many people in my uh, live workshops. I'm like, name me a sport that's good for us orthopedically. And they'll say swimming. I said, I've dealt with uh, collegiate swimmers, their low back, their neck, their shoulders, trust me, and their knee during different kicks because it's repetitive. All of you here through the NASM 
that came through that curriculum, you understand proper biomechanics. You understand how the body can accept load the best. That doesn't mean that that's what happens in sports. So that's why athletic trainers, physical therapists have these jobs because our job is to hopefully, and corrective exercise specialists and all of you, get people moving well so they can handle the demands of sports. But at some point they could overload themselves and that's what we come in for. But as we've seen in the fitness industry now, sport has become a part of fitness. So we just need to decide what's our goal. Is our goal fitness where we want people that just want to get in shape safely and they're not trying to be competitive? Or does somebody want to compete in a sport or the sport of fitness? And what's our roles and responsibility from a training standpoint? So we'll continue on with this concept. We'll move forward here. So sport is an activity involving physical exertion and skill in which an individual or team competes against another for entertainment. Nothing wrong with sport. That's, that was my first career. I love it. I still, as much as I can, do mixed martial arts. I don't do it because it's good for me orthopedically. I do it because it's time for me to clear my mind. I enjoy the skill of it. I enjoy being around the people that have a passion for it. Never going to stop doing it. So if you were training me and said, Marty, it's not safe for you to do it, I would go hire another trainer. Your job is to get me moving as well as possible so I can handle the demands of my sport. So same thing here, whether it's any of these sports now that can compete in, in the sport of fitness, our job is to get them on training programs to give them the best chance to succeed in their sport, whether it's running long distances, whether it's sprinters, whether it's people doing the new things that you see in the fitness industry. But again, be understanding that people will do things in sport that may not be safe. So we got to navigate sport versus fitness and what's our roles and responsibilities. And one of the things that always you know, got me early on, and I, again, I don't blame uh, novice people that aren't, you know, don't study what we study. They would come and say, Marty, I'm going to train with you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run for a while. I'm going to get in shape before I want to train. And I'd say, well, you're going to run. And they're like, yeah. And I said, you just admitted you're not in great shape. They're like, yeah, I'm going to run to get in shape. Remember, guys, we and gals, we never play a sport to get in shape. We get in shape to play a sport. I, I'm sure all of you know that, right? So I would get, I would talk to the people that want to run. So, okay, you know, let's get you at least, let me show you at least a corrective exercise program and some stabilization work and some walking to running progressions before you just go run. Because the last thing we want is people to have these overuse injuries by doing a sport to get in shape. And that's why. Elite athletes have a team of people like myself and others around them all the time to get them in shape. So let's carry that into the fitness industry as well. So we'll continue moving uh, on here with this concept. So going back to athletic trainers, this is where sports and medicine meet. That's why it's sports medicine. And some interesting statistics. In other words, half of the running population gets injured in some way every year. And this estimate may be very uh, much on the low side. I think we all probably have some experience with that. And the literature varies from 2.5 to 12.1 injuries per thousand hours of running. Most running injuries are lower extremity injuries with a predominance for the knee. And then obviously foot and ankle and low back and hip is, are in there as well. So once again, we could get in there with our, our runners that maybe don't come into the gym. Maybe they think running is enough. But think about how much work we could do with them from stabilization, corrective exercise, and getting their core and glutes to fire in. Going back to a relationship we had with Michael Johnson, uh, interesting statistic they brought up, there's more core activation during sprinting than during planks. It makes total sense. If I'm rotating my arms and legs at top speed, where is everything connected? It's to the core. So again, we have to get in shape through training programs to start participating in our sports. So we'll move forward here. So again, looking at movements versus muscles, I never train a muscle. I might term it a muscle. I might tell somebody, okay, we're going to do a core exercise or a back exercise or a leg exercise because I'm speaking to somebody that may not have the understanding if I went more technical. But all of us here train movement patterns. And if you look at movement patterns, you're going to see some similarities. So one of the major movement patterns we should all be training is triple flexion to triple extension. And so you can see that that matters for sprinting. You can see that matters for deadlifting, squatting, and all these other things. And what I always found interesting when we're training these, just like anything else, there should always be what's my next most logical progression. 
And what I see in exercise programs, sometimes I see a lunge, sometimes I see a squat, sometimes I see a jump, sometimes I see a single leg, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. There is a way to stack these in order. So from a triple flexion to triple extension standpoint, forget load right now, okay? It doesn't matter what phase of training you're in. You need to learn how to squat properly first. Why does basis support teaching people the proper mechanics from triple flexion to triple extension? Then you would do a step up because you can do a very small step up, right? Two inches, four inches, six inches. Learning to transition that triple flexion to triple extension towards one leg. Then we'd get into lunges. Then we'd get into the single leg squats. That can all be done in stabilization. Then sure, if you want to load them and, and they progress their strength, go back to a squat. Go back to a step up, then go to the lunge, then go to single leg squat. And then if you go to power, you're going to start the exact same way again. We're training movement patterns. So by the time they get to sprinting and deadlifting and all that, that pattern is so ingrained in their head, they know how to do it, and then they can do it under load, and they can do it explosively. That's creating a training progression instead of, all right, today we're going to do lunges. Not saying that you're not going to burn calories, not saying you're not going to activate muscles, but we're just trying to hammer down that training principle. So let's move forward again here. So going back to the OPT model and these different planes of motion. So if I was going to draw up a periodization plan, first, we're going to go through stabilization. We're going to start in the sagittal plane because that's the most common for people. So sagittal plane is your flexion extension exercises. Now, I'm not talking about machines here, leg extension, leg curl. Yes, there are machines named that, but that's I'm just giving you sagittal plane motions. Squat, bicep curl, tricep extension. Then frontal plane is ab and adduction, lateral raises, ab and adduction for the lower body. And then transverse plane motion is internal external rotation, trunk rotation, shoulder internal external rotation, hip internal external rotation so when you combine for uh the squat the step up the lunge the single leg squat through the th three different phases through the entire opt model there is a very large framework or matrix for your yearly programming so i'll just give squat for example people are like well it's a satchel plane exercise what do you mean frontal plane i can squat in the frontal plane i could take a step to my right squat, come back up, take a step to my left, squat. I added a frontal plane component. So I have to control that frontal plane as I go in and out of the squat. And then I could turn 90 degrees and do that same squat again. So I can do that with all my exercises, almost all, and go through the squat to step up, to lunge, the single leg squat, sagittal, frontal, transverse, and other progressions, then stabilization, strength, power. There is your large programming. Again, then you add in the engagement, the coaching style, the fun, the, the, the facility that you have to make it fun and engaging. Your clients don't need to know how much training progressions they're on. They're, they won't know just between exercise or training. They're just going to know amazing results. But it gives you the ability to, over a course of a year, to know exactly what's next for your clients and or groups that you might be working with. So as we wind down here, Again, I could have spent hours on each one of these, but the next slide kind of sums this up in, in, a, in a kind of in a nutshell. What we're looking for is we're looking for training programs. We want people to train smarter, not just harder. And one of the concepts I think that really brings this home is I've had this conversation with elite athletes and I've had it with my country club athletes that are in their 70s. And I had a female member at a country club that was a, a dynamite. She went through all three phases of training. She didn't really understand that I had progressed her because she didn't care to know. I would have been more than happy to educate her. She's like, Marty, I trust you. Just tell me what's next. So one day she comes up to me and she goes, I got to tell you, Marty. She goes, we need to might do something different. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I've never been sore. She goes, I, I, I'm just, we're just not working hard enough. I said, well, can you tell me why you think that first before I give you my response? She's like, well, got to be sore. She goes, we're not doing enough. I said, okay. I said, can we take a look back at your last six months of training? And I gave her all of our assessments. I went back to all the assessments I did and showed her 38%, 45%. You're golfing 18 holes instead of nine holes. You Now you're driving the ball 160 yards instead of 120. And she kept just looking, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, your body weight went down. Yeah, you're spending more time on cardio and your speed. She goes, yeah, it's amazing. And I said, so why do you need to be sore? 
And she looked at me and she goes, well, I thought that's just the way that it had to be. I said, no, I said, my job as your fitness professional, once we got on a roll and I knew how you respond to exercise and I knew how to communicate with you and coach you and gave you a couple of days to kind of get used to exercise. My job is to fatigue you appropriately as you walk out, make sure you come back refreshed. And I said, if you, and she goes, yeah, that's what happens pretty much every time. Yeah, every time. And I said, you've never come back in sore. She goes, no. I said, so my job is to make things, to give you the maximum amount of results with the least amount of effort. And at first it boggled her mind, but then when she looked at the results, she goes, okay, that makes sense. So in a nutshell, when you follow the science, follow the model that you trained on, if you think about our role, it's to get people to train smarter, not just harder, and take it away from maybe an exercise program into a specific training program. So in conclusion, I hope that helps kind of just share these two massive amazing companies on how much they dig into the science and try to bring that to all of you in the fitness industry so you can get the best outcomes with whomever you work with. So I can't thank you enough, Greg, who's been advancing our slides here for me, or, you know, the guy behind the scenes that makes all this possible, and everybody at NASM and everybody at Techno Gym, we can't thank you enough for attending. Hope you found it helpful, and you can reach me there at my Techno Gym email, mmiller at technogym.com. And if you're new to Techno Gym, I hope you check us out, and feel free to hit me up anytime if there's anything I can ever do for you. So I'll turn it over to Greg, our editor, to see if there's any questions that came in, or if you guys are still sending those questions in, he will recap those and then send them to me, and I will email you personally. So thank you guys so much.